Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden and I will be your host this evening as we travel along to Athens and the Greek islands with our very special guest, Nikki Vlachou. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our guide for this evening, Nikki Vlachou. Yes, so Nikki. Yes, us. Nikki, thank you so much for being here. And I just said Yasu and you said Yasas. What is the difference between those two words? Yasu is when you're referring to one person. Yasas is uh, when you're greeting several people. It's the plural. Great. Right. And so we start off the night with a mini Greek lesson. And Nikki, where are you joining us from this evening or this morning? I am in Athens. In Athens, I am uh, in Holargos district, which uh, was the um, home district of Pericles. Oh wow! There's just history everywhere you look in Athens. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And Nikki, it's fun for me that you are the guest tonight because back in 2019, when I went on the Rick Steves Greece tour, you were my local guide in Olympia. Oh, how nice. Yes. Was your, was your guide good? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's very glamorous, very knowledgeable. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And Nikki, how long have you been working with Rick Steves Europe? For almost 20 years now. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. And are you from Athens originally? No. Actually, I'm um, a countryside girl. Uh, all of my childhood, I have spent it in uh, Western Greece, um, next to the Ionian Sea, the, the sea that separates Italy from uh, Greece. My hometown is uh, Mesolonghi, which is very, very historical for uh, Greek people and for the revolution against the Ottomans after the 400 years of occupation, a city where Lord Byron had spent uh, several years of uh, his life and um, a beautiful part of uh, our country, which is not very famous though for uh, tourists that come to Greece. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the fun parts about Greece is to visit those places that maybe aren't visited as much. It's true. Yes. And tonight we have our video editor, Zen. He made a neat little map of the places we'll be visiting tonight. We are visiting some of the more popular islands, and of course, Athens. But we are visiting some more off the beaten path places as well. And so let's just take a little look at where we're headed tonight. There we are. And so we're starting out the night tonight in Athens. And then we can just take a little boat over to Idra and then off to Santorini and Mykonos. And Nikki, I'm curious, what is the most common way to get between the most popular islands that people visit? Usually um, uh, boats because um, they go very frequently and um, it doesn't take that long to get from uh, one island to the other. But uh, several of them have airports, so people that um, want to get there faster might fly to them. Mm -hmm. And tonight we're starting off the evening at the Acropolis in Athens. And Nikki, when I was watching this show the first time, I was just looking at the Acropolis just built up on the hill there. And I thought, I don't know if there's any other site that's comparable in all of Europe. And what do you think? Do you think there's anything else that could beat the Acropolis? Well, um, Acropolis uh, itself uh, as a word means top of the city. It's uh, the top of the city, it um, dominates the whole city of uh, Athens. And um, it's the most emblematic, the most iconic um, uh, monument on top of it, the Parthenon that um, all of us uh, get to, to look at and um, feel so proud of uh, our history, the classical uh, Greek history, which um, consists the cradle of Western civilization today. So um, I would say that there are so many other great monuments all around uh, Europe that have been very much influenced by the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Mm -hmm. It's the cradle of so much. And it's amazing that we still have the opportunity to visit it to this day. Oh, yes. And um, it's not just uh, a temple that has been injured, that um, has been restored and still stands up there. It's all that um, idea that um, the ideas actually that uh, it represents and there's so many things that started in um, Athens and the rest of Greece at the time that the Parthenon was built, the fifth century BC. Wow. And with that amazing introduction of the Acropolis, let's head there now with Rick. 
We'll start up there at the historic, cultural, and literal high point of any trip to Athens, the Acropolis. Like other hilltop sites in the ancient Greek world, Athens' Acropolis, or High City, was both a place of worship and of refuge when under attack. Crowned by the mighty Parthenon Temple, the Acropolis rises above modern Athens, a lasting testament to Greece's glorious golden age in the 5th century BC. Grand processions followed the Pan-Athenaic Way, which was a ceremonial path connecting the town below and the Acropolis. They'd pass through this imposing entryway and up to the religious heart of the city and the Parthenon. The Parthenon was perhaps the finest temple in the ancient world. Valiantly battling the acidic air of our modern world, it still stands with the help of ongoing restoration work. It was constructed in the 5th century BC and dedicated to the virgin goddess Athena. Seeing it today is awe-inspiring, but imagine how striking it must have looked when it was completed nearly 2,500 years ago in all its carved and brilliantly painted splendor. The adjacent Erechtheion is famous for its Porch of the Caryatids, six beautiful maidens functioning as columns. Dedicated to Athena and Poseidon, this was one of the most important religious buildings on the Acropolis. This, rather than the Parthenon, was the culmination of the Pan-Athenaic procession. Rick mentions here how tourists are in awe of the Acropolis when they're there and the temple, especially I think American tourists, since we don't really have any visible ancient ruins here in the US anyway. Nikki, how did the Greeks feel about the Parthenon? Uh, we pretty much feel the same way. Um, we are so proud of our history. And um, when we look at the Parthenon, when we look at all of these monuments that um, surround the Parthenon, but are also on the base of the Acropolis and the ancient Agora and the rest of the historic um, city center, we, um, we we feel so, so proud of what we have achieved. And um, it all gives us energy to keep going and um, makes us realize that um, for 2,500 years now, our language, our history, our culture has remained the same. And that's something to keep us going. And that people have been feeling that way for thousands of years too, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, just kind of this beacon upon the hill. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, let's continue along here. At the foot of the Acropolis, the ancient Agora, or marketplace, sprawls out from its surviving temple. This is where, for 3,000 years, Athenians gathered. While the Acropolis was the center of ritual and ceremony, the Agora was the beating heart of ancient Athens. For some 800 years, starting in the 6th century BC, this was the hub of commercial, political, and social life. Visitors wander the remains of what was the city's principal shopping mall and administrative center. Exploring the Agora, it's fascinating to ponder the world of Plato and Aristotle in the age which laid the foundations for Western thinking about economics, democracy, logic, and more. The Stoa of Attilus from the second century BC was rebuilt in modern times to house the Agora's museum. With so little of the Agora still standing, this reconstruction makes it easier to imagine the site in its original glory. Crowds would gather in shady porticos like this to shop, socialize or listen to the great philosophers of the age. In fact, Socrates spent much of his life right here, preaching the virtues of nothing in excess and urging those around him to know thyself. The Temple of Hephaestus, one of the best preserved and most typical of all Greek temples, dates from about 400 BC. Like the Parthenon, it's constructed in the simple Doric style. It housed big bronze statues of Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, and Athena, patroness of the city. Greek architecture evolved in stages. The capitals, or tops of the columns, were both functional and decorative. While just the tip of the architectural iceberg, these are handy indicators helping us identify the three main architectural orders, or styles. The earliest style, Doric, has flat, practical plates as capitals. In the next order, Ionic, the capitals are decorated with understated scrolls. The final order, Corinthian, 
popular later on with the Romans, features leafy capitals, boldly decorative, with no apologies necessary. How to remember all these? As the orders evolve, they gain syllables. Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. But for most travelers, the Agora is more than an architectural review. Strolling in the footsteps of Socrates is your best opportunity to commune with the epic Greek past. Like so many great civilizations, ancient Greece peaked and then faded. 200 years ago, Athens was just a small town surrounded by big ruins sitting on lots of history. That 19th century Athens is today's Plaka. The Plaka district provides tourists with a more intimate Athens. No chaotic traffic, lots of colorful restaurants, and the best souvenir shopping in all of Greece. In this clip, Nikki, Rick mostly focuses on the ancient sites of Greece, and then he touches on the Plaka, which is a more modern area that you can visit. What are some of the other top sites in Athens that you would recommend tourists see? Um, all of the center of Athens um, has an amazing combination of um, ancient um, Middle Ages and more modern uh, times uh, monuments that someone um, can visit, or the districts even of the city center that you can walk through to get from one place to the other are um, all together in one area. But um, I would definitely recommend to people that come to Athens to get lost through Plaka and then Monastiraki or Bziri area, where you turn one corner and you see a rubble of an ancient monument, an ancient theater, or uh, parts of the ancient and the Roman um, Agora. And then you see shops right next to you or a more modern building. I, I definitely think that uh, people have to visit uh, when they come to Athens, the Marble Stadium, which was uh, renovated for um, the modern Olympic Games, the first modern Olympic Games to take place in 1896, which is, by the way, the only stadium in the world which is completely built out of marble. And then uh, if they would like to move a little bit further um, out of the city center, we have the Nyarchos uh, Foundation, which is right by the sea. We have um, the coastal drive that um, leads to uh, Cape Sunion, where there is another temple dedicated to Poseidon. And to get there, you pass from all of the modern districts um, of Athens. And then, of course, we have um, the modern Odeon, the modern uh, conference centers, and um, many other amazing buildings that combine ancient and uh, modern Greek architecture. And all of these are easily accessible with Athens as your home base? Oh, yes. Um, for example, the, the Cape Sunion um, site that I just mentioned is only an hour and a half uh, drive away from Athens, but the drive is um, through the city and then parallel to the water, and you don't really feel much um, of uh, being away from the city center. Mm -hmm. And you see the Saroni Gulf, the, uh, the Aegean Sea, all the way and how it expands all the way to the ancient temple. The rest of the places I mentioned are um, on walking distance or by taxi. You can be there in 10, 15 minutes from the city center. Wow. There's so much diversity there too, from the, the marble arena for the Olympics in 1896, I think you said, to the ancient temple for, um, for Poseidon. Yeah. Oh, yes, which was built uh, in order to, um, to please Poseidon who was very mad at the Athenians because they chose Athena to become their patron <laughs> goddess. And Athens was a naval power, so they needed to um, keep him happy. So they built a micrography of the Parthenon right outside of the city center. Did it work? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <fast. laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and one more thing I would like to, uh, to add, um, for people that um, will have the opportunity to visit Athens, um, on the slopes of the Acropolis, we have uh, a Roman Odeon from the second century AD, which is called Herodion. This is um, an Odeon that is still uh, in use today. And we have performances, music, uh, theatrical uh, performances at night. And I think that it's um, an experience of a lifetime for somebody to be able to, um, to be under the, the Athenian sky, under the lead up Acropolis and attend a performance right into the ancient uh, Odeon. Wow. Well, in the next clip that we are going to see is from a more recent uh, series that Rick did called The Art of Europe. And Nikki, you are featured in the ancient art episode. So I was excited that we could show this clip tonight. 
And Nikki, just really quickly, how was it working with Rick and being on camera? Amazing, challenging and uh, amazing. And uh, always an opportunity to learn more and more uh, things about um, how to um, share all of uh, our knowledge and um, culture and history with uh, people that honor us by visiting our country. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see Nikki in the Art of Europe Ancient Art Show. With a local guide, we're tracking the evolution of Greek sculpture from the early Archaic Age to the Classical Era. That's roughly 700 to 400 BC. This is all archaic art, meaning the time of Greek history that they started making statues out of marble that were still very much influenced from the Egyptians. The archaic statues uh, would have um, very common characteristics between them, mm -hmm. more generic characteristics. The hair would be long and uh, beautifully curled. Their faces would have a frozen smile, would have uh, the almond-shaped eyes, the high eyebrows, and would in general look very much alike. It's like they're all cousins. They have exactly. this same little grin. Yes, they do, they do. And the names were Kuros for the boys and Kori for the girls, very generic. Just boy, girl. Just boy, girl. So they, they didn't really have a very sophisticated understanding of the body. No, the body's looking more oversized. All of the parts of the body are there, their shoulders, their knees, and the general characteristics of the body anatomy. But yes, they were more stiff and steady, and if they could move, they would look like monsters. So we move to the classical times, statues that evolve same way as knowledge of the human body evolves and they are able to depict beauty and anatomy on a much better way. From the archaic times where the statues were stiff and steady, we pass to more freedom and more balance of um, the way that the body is depicted and to the contrapposto way of posing. Contrapposto is the way of posing the statues would uh, depict that is kind of having the body shaping the shape of letter S with all the weight of the body leaning on the one leg, leaving the one shoulder more relaxed and the body showing more movement. This is a beautiful statue from the classical times, depicting um, either Zeus or Poseidon. We don't really know since what he was holding has not been found. If it was Poseidon, he would be holding his trident. If it was Zeus, he would be holding his thunderbolt. It's a statue that really shows how confident and strong the Greeks felt right after the end of the war with the Persians. So through art, they were absolutely showing the way that they felt. And it clearly shows uh, a mastery of the body. They understand the anatomy. And what time period was this from? This is from the classical times, specifically from 460 BC. So if I was walking through Athens, 460 BC, what would it be like from an art point of view? Athens in 460 BC would be like an open-air museum. Walking through the city, you would see nothing else but beautiful art. Colorful marble statues, bronze statues and temples, everywhere you would look at. Mm. Nikki, I love this clip. And I also just love the expressions on you and Rick's face here. You can just tell you both have such an admiration for history and art. And yes, and I'm sorry, yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering, here you said Athens in 460 BC would be like an open air museum, which it is a little bit to this day. And I'm curious, you said during this time that this art like this Poseidon or Zeus that we saw here showed the confidence and strength that the Greeks felt. Do you think there's still lots of pride amongst Greeks for, the, for your history? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, since the day we're born, since um, the day we're able to communicate with our parents and then with our uh, teachers at school, uh, we're being uh, told stories of the Greek mythology and um, how important all that we have um, achieved and we have created uh, back in the day has been and still is uh, for the world. Uh, we're very, very proud of our history. And um, we, we keep on referring to it, um, to each other and to our children as uh, we bring them up, trying to give them um, a good motivation for them to, um, to use these values and these ideas of the ancient Greeks that were based on discipline, on um, respect for each other in order to become better people. Wow, and there's so much you can draw from as well in your history. So I love to see that those 
traditions continue and that you learn about Greek mythology in school. We had that question in the past since we touch on it a little bit in the US, but it is part of the curriculum for everyone in Greece. Oh yes, and um, I, I I often talk to my to my guests about that. My my grandmother, who um, I'm not sure if she had graduated um, from school. I mean, she had only gone to school for a few years. My bedtime stories when I was a little girl were stories about the Cyclops, about Ulysses, about the Trojan War. Instead of um, you know stories that we talk to kids about uh, today, like uh, Cinderella and the Red Hooded and all that. I would hear stories about the Cyclops and the Ulysses. <laughs> and I, I guess it wasn't just my family. Most of the kids uh, are growing up like this. I wish we had those stories. They're much more interesting. <laughs> mm, some of them, you know, the Greek mythology is uh, very um, meaningful and very educational, but a lot of its stories are a little bit cruel for little kids to um, to hear about. Think about Kronos, who was eating his own kids and um, talking to kids about stories. <laughs> like but um, many, many of them are fascinating um, still to that day to little and older, uh, to younger and older people. Well, in this next scene, we are headed back to the Parthenon, but this time we're getting a bit of an art history perspective on it. So it's interesting to learn a little bit more about it. Here you go. By 500 BC, Athens was becoming the bustling center of a growing Greek-speaking world. The energetic Athenians built up their sacred hill, the Acropolis, turning it into the heart of their culture. They topped the Acropolis with glorious temples, statues, and monuments honoring the gods and celebrating their own achievements. This temple was famed for its caryatids, beautiful maidens functioning as columns, striking for their realism and relaxed poses. But the greatest temple was the Parthenon, dedicated to Athena, the patron of Athens. In its heyday, the temple was decorated with colorful painted sculpture. And inside stood a 40-foot tall golden ivory statue. This is a reproduction of the goddess Athena. Dazzling in both beauty and power, both the statue and the temple had a huge impact on people. The temple is massive. 230 feet long and 100 feet wide, made from the finest white marble and assembled here like a 70,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. Its 34-foot tall columns are simple yet elegant. The architects used clever, if subtle, optical illusions that added to the harmonious effect. The steps intentionally arc upward in the middle to compensate for how a flat line appears to sag. The columns lean together just slightly and bulge in the middle as if absorbing the weight of the stone roof. Altogether, it's organic. Rather than static stone, it feels alive, with perfect proportions, as if heroically connecting with the gods. Subconsciously, it works. A 2,500-year-old architectural triumph. The typical Greek temple is circled by decorative panels carved reliefs called metopes. The building inside the columns is called the cella, which itself is often decorated by a ring of carved reliefs called a frieze. And remember, it wasn't just bare white marble, it was full of color. This reconstruction shows how a temple's triangular pediments were filled with statues, originally brightly painted, which told the mythological story of that place of worship. Nikki, do you remember when they discovered that these marbles all used to be painted? Was it a big surprise to you? No, actually, uh, this is another thing that uh, we learned from um, from very um, uh, early, from from very from when we were very young, from school, since we go first go to school, and. Um, Although we can't really visualize what they would have been like being full in color, uh, we were we are all aware that all these statues used to be colorful. Wow. I remember growing up, I think just in the last couple of years, we learned more that things used to be painted and we always just imagined them as the pure white, you know, that we always saw thinking of Greece. So that's neat that you had learned all the, <laughs> your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, next up, we are heading away from Athens and we are zooming over to the island of Idra. And Idra, you can take a hydrofoil boat from Athens. I think it's just maybe two hours, Nikki, do you know from? Less than that. It's um, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes by hydrofoil to get there. 
but it's a beautiful island not too far away. And let's go explore Idra, our first island for the evening. Let's go. Cool. We're riding a flying dolphin, one of the fleet of speedy hydrofoils that zip from Athens to the islands and from island to island. It's fast but less scenic as the passengers are stuck inside. I like to hang out in the windy doorway. After a 90-minute ride, Athens is a world away and we pull into the Isle of Idra. Its main town, also called Idra, is home to about 90% of the island's 3,000 residents. After the noise of Athens, Idra's traffic-free tranquility is a delight. I'm glad I'm packing light as I hike up to my hotel. Idra is one of the prettiest towns in Greece. Its superb harbor is surrounded by an amphitheater of rocky hills. There is an easy blend of workaday commerce, fancy yachts, and lazy tourists on island time. Donkeys rather than cars, the shady awnings of well-worn cafes, and memorable seaside views all combine to make it clear you found your Greek isle. Idra was a Greek naval power famous for its shipbuilders. The harbor, with twin forts and plenty of cannon, housed and protected the fleet of 130 ships as the Greeks battled the Turks in their early 19th century War of Independence. The town stretches away from the harbor, a maze of narrow cobbled streets flanked by whitewashed homes. In the 1960s, the island became a favorite retreat for artists and writers who still draw inspiration from its idyllic surroundings. One of the island's greatest attractions is its total absence of cars and motorbikes. Instead, donkeys do the heavy hauling today, just as they have through the centuries. And I suppose for just as long, they've treated children to rides as well. At the top of the town, the humble Taverna Leonidas has been around so long, it doesn't need a sign. The island's oldest and most traditional taverna was the hangout of the local sponge divers a century ago. These days, Leonidas and Paniota feed guests as if they're family. And tonight, the place is all ours as our enthusiastic cook welcomes us into his kitchen. So what are we yeah. cooking? Uh, we cook uh, lamb with uh, roast potatoes. Grilled shrimps. Oh yeah. With oil lemon sauce. Calamari with a garlic sauce. Very good. Uh, Spanakopita, spinach pie. Spinach pie. Yeah. Eggplant, yeah. and uh, beets. And before we know it, Leonidas has us all sitting at the table and he starts bringing in wave after wave of his fabulous dishes. Here we go, the shrimp. Yeah, the shrimps, grilled shrimps. Nice. With the oil lemon sauce. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Wow, well, that sure looks like a Greek feast. And Nikki, I think one of the biggest draws of going to Greece is the food. And I know that you really enjoy cooking. And I think you have two recipes to share with us tonight. Oh, um, I would love to, to share um, more complicated recipes with you, but um, I don't think we have the time for that. Uh, what I would like to um, quickly um, mention is how to make the um, original Greek salad, because um, I realize uh, by most Americans that uh, visit Greece for the first time that they think that the Greek salad um, contains lettuce, which is the way that they serve it in most Greek restaurants in the U.S. That's that's not true. Here in Greece, um, we only use fresh um, ingredients, whatever we, we cook. And um, in the summertime that we mostly enjoy eating the Greek salad, there is no lettuce. So um, there's only uh, tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, onions. Uh, if you wanna make it even more delicious, um, some caper, um, wild oregano, olives, of course, and uh, Greek feta, which when you buy it in Greece, again, it's so much different than when you buy it in the US. and seasoning it with uh, the oregano, like I mentioned, and extra virgin olive oil and fresh bread. It's, it's, a, it's a full meal, yeah. full of protein, and full of vitamins. So that's very easy to make. And very easy to make is also um, the Greek um, 
guacamole, I should say, the Greek uh, <laughs> sauce that uh, you can pair most dishes with, especially um, meat or uh, bread, tzatziki, it's called. Um, we are very famous for our yogurt. I think that it's, uh, it's a big thing all over the world right now, the Greek yogurt, which, um, again, it has to do with the quality of uh, the milk and the way that they... Um, produce it but it's also the fact that the original Greek yogurt is strained so it's uh, thicker so we only use this thicker um, yogurt with uh, garlic with uh, cucumber extra virgin olive oil a little bit of uh, vinegar and olive oil some people also add um, sliced carrots in it but that's that's not necessary to do and dill you mix it all together and um, it's delicious, it goes with everything. Yeah. And I think it's the quality of, ingredient, of ingredients that makes such a big difference. They're fresh, like you mentioned, and high quality. Yes, everything tastes uh, tastes different here, especially our fruits and our vegetables, um, the, the soil, the climate, the fact that we don't uh, mass produce um, most of our fruits and vegetables makes them smell and taste uh, very different than in many other parts of the world, especially northern parts of the world, where the sun doesn't shine as much. Yeah. <laughs> and with tzatziki, what would you usually serve that with, like a, a some sort of bread or? You can have it uh, just with, with bread, yes, and you can top it with a little bit extra olive oil on top. But um, what we usually love combining it with is grilled meat or adding it into the pita. Pita is um, like a um, um, slice of bread. It's, um, it's the way that we wrap um, grilled meat or uh, gyros. Some people call it gyros. It's um, a sliced spicy meat that comes uh, of um, a spit. And then we have the tzatziki with some um, tomatoes, some onions, and uh, it's absolutely delicious. Wow. Well, now you have recipes for the next time you want to have a little Greek dinner night. It's always fun. And dream about traveling to Greece. <laughs> and we just visited the island of Idra. And we visit this island on the Rick Steves Greece tour. And I love it. It's just, I was also there in the off season. So it wasn't very crowded. And um, it didn't have quite that mass of tourists that you might find in some of the other bigger islands. And Nikki, we are going to be seeing Santorini and Mykonos tonight, which I think might be the top two island, Greek islands that people visit. And could you go through some pros and cons of going to a lesser known island, maybe like Idra versus Santorini and Mykonos? Um, I would like to be perfectly honest with you. Um, Mykonos and Santorini are so popular and get to be so crowded because they have reasons to be so popular. They're absolutely beautiful and worth visiting. Um, but for someone who would prefer to not have to, uh, to, with, to deal with people hanging from everywhere in the high season, I would definitely recommend um, an island that is not as popular like um, Hydra. But apart from Hydra, there are many more other islands that um, someone can get to. And usually these are the islands that either don't have an airport uh, to get there um, easier and faster, or are further away from um, Athens, from um, the port of Piraeus. What I would um, suggest to people is that um, if they have the time, they should try to combine visiting both, visiting either Mykonos and Santorini, or both of them, along with um, one or two of uh, the rest of the islands that uh, are not as... Uh, popular so that they get the different feel and realize how Mykonos and Santorini used to be <laughs> before um, the 70s and the 60s. And um, we have so many islands. People usually ask me, which island um, should I go to? Which is your favorite island? There isn't really a straight answer to that. We have um, almost 300 islands that are inhabited and we have uh, approximately 6,000 islands <laughs> in total. <laughs> that obviously are not all inhabited. Uh, but um, each one of them is so different from uh, the rest. What I love about Hydra, Hydra is um, the fact that it doesn't have any traffic. It doesn't have any cars like uh, Rick just uh, showed to us. 
So that absolutely gives you uh, a feel of relaxation and makes you enjoy more the fact that you can walk up and down the little alleys, the, enter the little churches, go around the beautiful buildings and not have to worry about traffic or feel like you're in a big modern area. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that is also one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much, just traffic free and you're just, you feel more free when <laughs> there's no traffic. Yes. Well, on the next clip, we do wrap up Idra a little bit and Rick has a beautiful sunset looking out over the water. And then we'll be flying over to Santorini and you'll see why it is such a popular island to visit. And I think even with the crowds, as Nikki mentioned, it's still worth a visit. All right, here we go. A fleet of taxis shuttle people to outlying hamlets and beaches. We're catching one for a windy survey of the island and to be dropped off for a scenic hike back into town. Idra is popular with walkers who come to explore the network of ancient paths that link the island's outlying settlements, churches, and monasteries. And in springtime, hikes come with fields of wildflowers. A delightful way to cap the day is to follow the coastal path to the village of Kamini. Its pocket-sized harbor shelters the community's fishing boats. Here with a glass of ouzo and today's catch, as the sun slowly sinks into the sea and boats become silhouettes, you drink to the beauties of a Greek island escape. The Aegean Sea offers the quintessence of Mediterranean island charm. Punctuated by romantic nights at sea, our itinerary promises plenty of unforgettable sightseeing. In the morning, we'll be in Santorini. I enjoy the scenic arrivals and departures by cruise ship. Being on the top deck as you approach the day's destination gives you a quiet, bird's eye view. Approaching an exotic and fabled island like Santorini as the moon sets and the sun rises, just kissing the lip of the breathtaking cliffs is worth getting up for. Santorini is a dramatic island, the rim of a volcanic crater with spectacular vistas. Once a complete island like its neighbors, it was a volcano that, about 3,500 years ago, blew its top, creating a caldera, this flooded crater. Today, Inviting whitewashed villages seem to crowd its dramatic ridges, as if jostling to enjoy the views. Because Santorini's pier is small, giant cruise ships drop anchor and tender their passengers in on small shuttle boats. Individuals go to the tiny Old Harbor, where they can ride a donkey up the zigzag trail, or hop a cable car to the scenic lip of the island crater. Those paying for the cruise line's excursion get off the ship first and head for an alternative port where buses and guides await. With the crush of the crowds, the limited time, and the scattered array of interesting sights, investing in a bus tour like this to see Santorini can make sense. Within minutes, you'll be powering up the switchbacks into the island as your guide narrates the drive. Those two are the Kameni Islands. The Kameni Islands are actually made of lava rock. Excursions also include scenic views from the bus and the stress-free efficiency of getting smoothly from point to point. And tour groups are sure to have free time at the best photo ops. Ia is the postcard image of the Greek Isles. This idyllic ensemble of whitewashed houses and characteristic domes is delicately draped over a steep slope at the top of a cliff. Viewpoints here are some of the most striking in the Greek seas as tourists clamor for just the right angle. Artists fall in love with Ia and move in. Honeymooners find the B&B &B of their dreams and savor breakfast in unforgettable settings. And at the quiet end of town, the old windmill reminds all of a more rustic age gone by. The whitewash, while scenic today, was originally practical. White reflects the powerful heat of the sun. The lime that makes the whitewash is a good antiseptic. Villagers knew it would naturally disinfect the rainwater that was collected on rooftops. And I love the way the blue and white of the townscape seems inspired by the colors of the Greek flag. 
Many of these dwellings originated as humble caves. With little building material on the island, it just made sense to dig into the cliffs. These cave houses, surrounded by air-filled pumice, are naturally insulated, staying cool in summer and warm in winter. Gradually, these cheapest bits of real estate were developed, and with tourism, they became today's expensive villas, hotels, and restaurants. Well, we can see here why Santorini is such a place that people go to take photographs because it is stunning. But, and the caldera there that was formed by an eruption thousands of years ago. But Nikki, what I find fascinating about this island is the history of Santorini before the volcano erupted. Could you tell us a little bit about the society that existed back then? Of course. Um, Santorini before the eruption of the volcano was um, round, was strogili as it was called, which means round in, uh, in Greek. And it had a little island right in the middle. And um, it, it was inhabited since 5000 BC. It had an amazing port. They were um, among the most important naval powers of the Cycladic civilization that flourished in the day in that part of the uh, Aegean Sea. So they used to trade um, with all of the Mediterranean and um, of course with the Egyptians. There is an amazing site in Santorini, an ancient site, the Greek Pompeii, as uh, we call it. It's called Akrotiri where they have discovered, um, and there's much more to be discovered, parts of that um, ancient city, which was covered by the ashes um, after the explosion of um, the volcano. They haven't found any bones or any bodies of people under the ashes. So they have figured out that uh, people were warned and they evacuated, they, they left the island probably after some serious earthquakes. I think it's absolutely worth visiting that uh, ancient site for whoever that uh, gets to spend some time in Santorini. And um, it's incredible to, to visit a site that has houses that date from way back 2000 or 3000 BC that already had uh, a sewage system. They had um, restrooms, they had bathrooms. They were two or three stories um, high and they have discovered their furniture inside the houses that... Um, looked very much, very similar to the furnitures we have today. Um, fossilized furniture, don't, don't get me wrong. They have um, found amazing frescoes, paintings that they had uh, on the walls, which represented beautiful landscapes, very oriental landscapes from the influence they got from their trips uh, around the, the world. And a lot of um, sea life and sea creatures on, the, on their walls. And it shows how uh, much ahead of their times they have gotten back in the day. So um, Santorini is not only a place where you will go to photograph those amazing views of uh, the caldera that now is like, a, like a, a half shaped moon. That's the shape of the island today. Half of it has sunk into the water. It's also an island where there is amazing uh, culture to, to discover, visiting the uh, ancient site of Akrotiri and the prehistoric museum that is on the island. I have to say that's one of my regrets. I visited Santorini just for about two days but I didn't, didn't visit Akrotiri, is that what it's called? Akrotiri, yes, Akrotiri. It's, it's how it is called. Uh, look, it's two days is not enough time to see everything. And although Santorini is such a small island that there is so much to do, there are so many things um, to experience. Um, amazing food, uh, great wineries, some um, of the best wines um, in the world come from that island because everything now uh, uh, that is being produced on the island grows on um, on the soil that has um the this um these substances from um the uh, uh explosion of the volcano so um there are wine there are fava beans uh, there is a famous fava that is being produced on the island there are cherry tomatoes and so many other products are delicious to taste while you're there and there are so many wineries to visit then there are some smaller villages apart from ia like the village of Emborio that even has a fort that is absolutely worth visiting, some beaches. So I think that you have to come back. Yes, and see what <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, we'll continue on and see Rick enjoying some of that delicious food that they grow on Santorini in mm -hmm. this next clip. With each port, you've got sightseeing options. You can take the organized bus tour and be on their timetable, or you can hire a private guide. And I'll pause and say here, Rick is talking about the different types of tours 
because this clip is from his episode on cruising and how you can cruise around the Mediterranean. So just to give a little context. You can use a guidebook and be your own guide, or you can just hang out and be thoroughly on vacation. There's no right or wrong. It depends on your mood and your style. I've left our bus tour early for a rendezvous with a private local guide. Uh, we had a big earthquake back in 1956, 7.8 Richter scale, destroyed very many houses, like this captain's house over here. And on the other side, you can see that Venetian fortress is destroyed. It's been there since the 14th century. To get the absolute most out of our Santorini day, I've booked half a day with Demetris. While pricey, if two couples split the cost, enjoying the services of a private guide can cost about the same as the cruise line's bus tour. Of Santorini's many beaches, Camari is one of the best. The black sand is a reminder of the island's volcanic origin. Typical of Greek island resort beaches, it's lined with rentable lounge chairs and a strip of seafood restaurants. And with Demetris, I know exactly what I'm eating. These salads look delicious. Can you tell me about them? Well, we have here a Greek salad and a Santorini salad. The difference with the local salad is that we use the local tomatoes, the cherry tomatoes, the local cucumbers, and instead of the feta cheese, we use the goat cheese, and we add the capers and the caper leaves. See, you can eat them. They taste good. Right, we've got uh, some sardines here, grilled. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, we've got uh, a very nice grilled calamari, also served with salad, the lemon, and the olive oil. Yes. This is a healthy diet. This is the Mediterranean diet. Well, that Greek salad looked delicious and fresh. <laughs> and the next island we're headed to is the island of Mykonos. Nikki, what are your thoughts on Mykonos? I love Mykonos. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an amazing island. So many reasons to want to go there. To go there. And is it common for the Greeks to go to Mykonos? Or I guess I'm just curious in general, where do the Greeks vacation? Um... Most of the Greek people um, have um, a home village where they will have some relatives, some ancestors or um, small house they have um, inherited from their parents or grandparents that they will visit in the summer. But those that get the opportunity will definitely uh, take some days off to go to a Greek island. But um, Mykonos is a more high end island and um, it's an island that not everybody uh, can afford to go and have his summer vacation. They might go for a weekend, though, from Athens. It's only three and a half hours ride by, by boat or just a half an hour uh, flight. So many Greeks, especially younger people, love going to Mykonos because it's famous for um, its parties, for um, the Hora part, the central part of uh, the island where there's a lot of great uh, shopping. And of course, for the parties that go on at the, the beach bars. So there isn't really one specific place the Greeks go to on vacation, but uh, the islands are definitely among the places they will uh, mostly choose to go to. And is it possible to bike around Mykonos? We'll see in this next clip, Rick shows you kind of get off the beaten path. And I'm just curious, is biking an option? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, in general, I wouldn't recommend biking on most of the Greek islands. Not only because um, driving around the islands um, is not very easy and most people that rent a car there, Greeks or not, are not very experienced with um, the roads that are wi windy and narrow, but also uh, because um, there are so many people that, you know, might get fascinated by the view and not look around them and um, you might have an accident for no reason. No, I wouldn't recommend biking on Mykonos unless if you're very risky. There are other ways to get around. That's a good tip. Everyone gets vacation brain. So <laughs> maybe <laughs> avoid biking. <laughs> All right, well, let's head to Mykonos. Mykonos is another small island with a small port inundated by cruise ship crowds. It's so iconic and beautiful that it's included in most major cruise ship itineraries. There's a pier for only one ship, so most ships drop the hook and shuttle their people in by tender. If visiting by cruise ship, it's smart to get an early start. We caught the first tender, beat the crowds and beat the heat. 
It's easy to enjoy Mykonos town with no planning, no tour, and no guide. This is a stop which lends itself to unstructured free time, just lazing on the beach, wandering and browsing the shops. It's the epitome of a Greek island town, a busy breakwater, fine little beach, and inviting lanes. While tourism dominates the economy, Mykonos still has a traditional charm, thickly layered with white stucco, blue trim, and colorful bougainvillea. Back lanes offer tranquility, away from the cruise crowds. As in many Greek island towns, centuries ago, the windmills of Mykonos harnessed the steady wind, grinding grain to feed its sailors. Five mills still stand, perfectly positioned to catch the prevailing breeze. A tidy embankment is so pretty they call it Little Venice. Wealthy shipping merchants built this row of fine mansions with brightly painted wooden balconies that seem to rise right out of the sea. Today, these mansions have been refitted as restaurants and bars for tourists enjoying fresh fish and romantic views. Mykonos' status in the last generation was as a fashionable destination for jet setters, and it retains a certain hip cachet. These days, tacky trinket stalls share the lanes with top-end fashion boutiques. Prices are high, and in season, the island is crammed full of vacationers. But even with four ships in the harbor today, there seems to be plenty of room. I love how, in the middle of all this modern tourism, the traditional culture carries on. At the tiny church built to bless those who go to sea, a fisherman and his wife pop in for a few meditative moments among age-old icons and flickering candles. Mykonos is small. Any point on the island is within a 20-minute drive. The windy roads feel like a fairground racetrack for tourists, busy with an array of easy-to-rent vehicles. And like most of them, we're heading for the beach. There's a range of beaches on Mykonos. The most trendy is Paradise, one of the ultimate party beaches in the Aegean. Presided over by hotels that run bars for young beachgoers, the paradise action is non-stop. While the beach becomes a raging dance floor after dark, the DJ's busy all day as the cruise set joins backpackers from around the world to enjoy the scene. As is standard around here, beaches rent comfortable lounge furniture with umbrellas. Just plop onto whatever appeals, don't worry, the drinks will come to you. If you prefer a quieter scene, the more remote beaches are a short drive farther out. While extremely arid, the stony countryside of Mykonos, complete with whitewashed churches and staggering views, is a delight for a quick road trip. Agio Sostis, an old hippie beach at the north end of the island, has none of the thumping party energy of Paradise Beach. It offers little beyond lovely sand, turquoise water, and tranquility. And for many, it's their Greek Isle dream come true. I think this is my Greek Isle dream come true right now, Nikki, in this cold Seattle winter. <laughs> <laughs> And I yeah, see why Mykonos, why you love Mykonos. It looks like there's a little bit of everything. There's the fun shopping and more of the party atmosphere if you want. But it looks like getting away from that, it's just very calm and tranquil, as Rick said here. You're absolutely right. Um, Mykonos is an island that combines almost everything that you would um, want from your vacation. Um, you have little kids and you just want to go to a nice resort and be right by the water and uh, enjoy the crystal clear waters and some good food and relax. There are places to do that in Mykonos. You don't necessarily have to be in uh, Paradise Beach where all the parties go on all night long until the sun starts ri to, to rise. <laughs> uh, you don't have to be down in Hora when all of the crowds are there. You can be more isolated on some of the, the beaches that are further away or some of the resorts that are further away. But there are so many people that want to go there because they want to do the shopping. They want to go to the bars. They want to see beautiful people dressed up beautifully, all the jet setters. The yachts, the number of yachts and the size of the yachts that dock all around Mykonos is 
quite a phenomena. So I think it's it's an island that uh, combines a lot of um, reasons to want to go there, not to mention what I um, believe we're going to be seeing uh, coming next, the amazing site of Delos, the island of Delos that's right next to it. And um, I think everyone in this world has to visit once in a lifetime. Mm. And Nikki, you've mentioned that you've been to Delos before, where we're headed next. And can you remember what your thoughts were or what your impression was when you were on the island? It's incredible to be on um, an island that it's um, all an archaeological site. There is not a single house, modern house, on that island, uh, except for some little constructions for some of the archaeologists and the guards of the archaeological site that um, live there. So it's incredible that you leave from this uh, super crowded and um, full of life island and you get to another one right next to it where there is just history, ruins, and you close your eyes and you travel back in time and um, you feel all the amazing ideas and things that started from there. Wow. And how long does it take to get from Mykonos to Delos? Approximately 35 to 40 minutes by, by boat. Wow. So an easy part of your day if you wanted. And I'm curious as well, some of these islands, do they shut down in the off season or is going in, or is going in March and October, let's say, still a fine time to visit? Uh, March, it will depend um, on the weather because uh, sometimes March can be tricky, but it's the time of the year that most of uh, the shops and places on these islands are starting to open up. Uh, October is still a, um, a month that um, most places are open and the weather is wonderful and um, there are many, many things to do on most of these islands. Even even the, the beaches are still crowded because the, the weather is um, not cold and you can still go for a swim into the sea. Even November, I would say, not necessarily for swimming, but um, it's a perfect month to visit these islands because normally in November we still have very beautiful weather. But then from December until late February, uh, most um, places are shut down. So you might visit those islands. They will definitely be much less expensive and not crowded at all, but you won't get the same experience. Yes, I was in Santorini in March and it was great because there were no crowds, but it was pouring rain <laughs> the entire time. But but that's fine, an excuse to go back. <laughs> Four days a year it rains in Santorini, and it was yeah. uh, <laughs> when you were there. <laughs> yes, <March. laughs> yeah. I brought the rain from Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's go back in time at the island of Delos in this final clip. Along with its beaches. Mykonos offers a major historic attraction. It's on an uninhabited neighboring island, a 30-minute shuttleboat ride away. The island of Delos was one of the most important places in the ancient Greek world. With temples honoring the birthplace of the twin gods Apollo and Artemis. Centuries before Christ, Delos attracted pilgrims from across the Western world. Delos was important in three different ancient eras. First, as a religious site. Then, as the treasury of the Athenian League. That was sort of the Fort Knox of the ancient world. And later, during Roman times, this was one of the busiest commercial ports in the entire Mediterranean. Delos ranked right up there with Olympia, Athens, and Delphi. Survey the remains of the ancient harbor. Foundations of shops and homes and hillsides littered with temple remains. The iconic row of sphinx-like lions still heralds the importance of the place. This was one of the Aegean world's finest cities. Imagine Delos in its heyday, a booming center of trade. Streets lined with 3,000 shops where you could buy just about anything dazzling mansions of wealthy merchants with colonnaded inner courtyards. There were fine mosaics, like this one of the god Dionysus riding a panther. Culture thrived here, enough to keep this theater, which could seat 6,000, busy. Innovative cisterns collected rainwater. These round arches date from the third century BC. Plumbing ran under the streets and water was plentiful. Local guides demonstrate still working wells. One of the 200 wells and cisterns in the city. 
fresh drinkable water from the rich aquifer underneath us. And it was enough to supply the 30,000 people at the peak of the flourish of the city. 30,000. So for more than 2,000 years, water has come out of this well. You can still drink if you want. Very nice. About a century before Christ, Delos was devastated by a terrible war. It never recovered and was eventually abandoned. After 14 centuries of silence and darkness, it was finally excavated in the late 1800s. And today, the ruins of Delos are ours to explore. I cap my visit by climbing to the summit of the island. My reward? One of the Mediterranean's great King of the Mountain thrills. As you observe the chain of islands dramatically swirling in 360 degrees, you can understand why historians believe that these Cycladic islands got their name from the way they make a circle or cycle around this oh-so-important little island of Delos. I love this clip here because it just shows you this kind of rugged and raw side of Greece that's just ancient and kind of mystical. And Nikki, I'm kind of curious if you had to choose between visiting an island like Delos, you only had a day, or visiting Mykonos nearby, if you had to pick, which one would you choose? <laughs> oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Look, um, I love, I love uh, sites and ruins because of what I do. So I would probably pick Delos, but um, visiting Delos, I would um, I would actually picture what Mykonos looks like today because this is this is amazing to think about it. Mykonos today is an island which is full of um, amazing villas, very very expensive uh, houses, not necessarily big ones, but. Uh, famous actors, jet setters, uh, ship owners have um, one of their several homes on the island of Mykonos and go there all the time. Um, Delos was pretty much the same thing uh, after the 5th century BC, back in antiquity, was where a lot of wealthy um, Athenians and other people had homes to go visit the place where they would have to socialize and mingle with um, other wealthy people of, of the day. It was a very cosmopolitan um, island apart from being a religious and uh, sacred island and um, so visiting Delos I would get a feel of what Mykonos looks like today. Wow well that is an amazing answer that I wasn't expecting <laughs> and I love that that you can go to Delos and picture imagine yourself being in kind of the Mykonos of its day. Wow that's awesome mm -hmm. and Nikki thank you so much for joining us tonight at Faristo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before we get to our questions. I had so much fun exploring Greece tonight, but we always have our little word from our sponsor. And our word from our sponsor tonight is the Rick Steves Audio Europe app, which I'll try to show you on my phone here. And this is just a free app that you can download and you can just click on find tours and interviews here. And Rick has pre-recorded hundreds of interviews and even walking tours. And he has four walking tours in Athens that you can download when you have Wi-Fi and then listen to them when you're walking around the city. So it's a great option when you're visiting a new place. And Nikki, let's see, let's get to the questions. Lisa has been sending me some of your questions tonight. Let's see here. Oh, and Nikki, let's see if you know this question. I bet you will. Uh, Annette is wondering, how do the temples in Agrigento, Sicily differ from the temples we saw in Athens? We, um, we still refer to Sicily uh, the way that um, they used to refer to it in the ancient times, uh, Magna Grecia, small Greece. Uh, Sicily uh, was one of those uh, very many places in the Mediterranean that has been colonized uh, by the Greeks. And um, many of those temples were basically influenced and um, based their architecture on the temples that um, were already built in the classical times in Greece itself. Wow. And have you been to the to Agrigento to see the temples in Sicily? No, I've never been to Sicily, and uh, I, I would love to. Uh, now I will plan on going there uh, hopefully soon. Um, they say that Sicily looks very, very much like the Peloponnese, which is the second half of uh, of Greece. I've met many people from Sicily, and they look so much like the people of um, southern Greece. And there are also many places in um, Sicily, smaller villages, where older people uh, speak uh, dialects 
that are based in, in Greek. Because people during um, the Roman times, because Greece became a Roman colony at some point, the Romans and the Greeks lived parallel lives for over 600 years. Uh, so people were bilingual uh, with Greek having been a more well-respected language. So they spoke Greek there as well and their dialects remain influenced by the Greek language, classical Greek language. Wow. This question kind of relates to that. Let's see here. Let's see if this question makes sense. It says, are signs in Greek letters and Roman letters, maybe old signs, that's what they're talking about? I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? They're asking about Greek letters. Oh, okay, in general, okay, in Greece. This is a modern day question. Okay, I was thinking it was an ancient question. Okay, they're saying, if uh, you're traveling around Greece, are signs written in Greek and also in um, English? Or in the... Our, uh, our it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting and funny what uh, what 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 goes on. Um, sometimes in, when people first arrive and they read signs, um, it sounds a little bit Greek to them, <laughs> <All Greek. laughs> because um, you will see a street sign, for example, referring to the city, how you can get to the city of Athens, but they won't be saying Athens. It's in Greek Athena. So underneath it will be transla translated as Athena written in Latin because um, they want not only English speaking people, but people from all over the world that visit to be able to um, read in Latin the um, exact translation of the Greek word of the destination they are headed to. But um, yes, there are signs in English everywhere and most people in Greece speak English. So it's very easy for people that don't speak Greek to get around. Yeah, I don't remember it being, well, I was also on a tour bus, so I was being driven around, but I don't remember having too much of an issue even walking around Athens finding mm -hmm. everything. Yes. Ashley's wondering, what would you say is one of the best kept secrets uh, to experience in Greece? It won't, it won't be a secret anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe something that's not too secret, yeah. <laughs> um... The way to um, to live a, to live happy and um, long and happy lives, which um, is the reason why we have um, several areas in Greece uh, having been characterized as uh, blue zones. So um, secret, I think everybody knows the secret, but how easy it is to follow this uh, philosophy? I don't know in uh, the modern world. Um, throw away stress, eat healthy. And enjoy life whenever you get the opportunity just uh, turn off your phone or uh, uh, leave work earlier and go have a drink with some uh, friends and enjoy life that sounds good to me <laughs> bob is wondering where did all the marble come from that you see all over greece and athens specifically? that's a very very nice question um what most people don't realize when they come to greece is how how mountainous and rocky this country is. 85% of Greece is considered by mountains. Once upon a time, Greece was underwater. So basically volcanic action, earthquakes that are bringing Greece hundreds of thousands of years ago out of the water. And that is how we got to have so many islands, tops of mountains that slightly came out of the water. And then the rest of the country, um, the mainland and the Peloponnese are basically a huge mountain range, the extension of the Alps, and we have huge mountains throughout the middle parts of the country, and then a few valleys and the coastlines um, lower down on the west and the east. So uh, basically every mountain you look at in Greece produces, gives, mount, uh, gives marble. It's just that there are better and not as good qualities of marble, especially for uh, the use that um, you want to use it for. The ancient Greeks would never use colorful marble to, to build statues. They would always use um, white marble to build um, statues and temples. The highest quality of marble in the ancient times came from the island of Paros, which is right next to Mykonos. They ran out of it. They use it all. And then the other very high quality of um, white marble we had and we still have in Greece comes from a mountain right outside of Athens, Pendeli. That was the, mount, the marble they used for the Parthenon and the rest of the monuments. But even in our homes um, um, or uh, the sidewalks, uh, the public buildings, uh, the bathrooms, everywhere you look at, we use marble because it's something that we can access easier and it's not as expensive as in other parts of the world to, to get it. Mm. 
Wow. You'll have to. I remember, I think in Santorini on the, the ground, there's maybe just kind of slabs of marble as kind of the sidewalk. I remember because it was raining, it was very slippery, <laughs> but it was impressive, yeah. The, Ac the Acropolis itself is a, a, a rock of marble, which is in a red gray color. And in many parts, it has been so well polished by the feet of so many thousands of people that uh, walk um, up and down um, for so many thousands of years on the Acropolis that it's absolutely like walking on uh, wet um, on wet um, floor, even when it's uh, dry. And uh, that was why recently, during the second quarantine, during COVID, uh, the Greek government has uh, uh, paved most of uh, the paths to get to the top of the Acropolis with um, concrete. Oh, wow. Yeah. Practical. Mm -hmm. Maybe that will last another thousand years. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And Susan has an interesting question. She's wondering, especially since you know history so well, Nikki, um, she says, if you could go back to any time in Greece's past, when and where would you go? Mm, I, um, I would, um, I, I've, I have thought of that uh, myself uh, quite a few times. I would want to experience two different periods of uh, history. One would be in prehistory, and most probably I would want to be in Crete for a little bit, in the Minoan uh, palaces and see uh, all these women that um, the frescoes and um, the other um, representations we have are depicting them with beautiful jewelry, amazing hairstyles and beautiful clothing, and see how these people lived in that so upgraded for their day um, civilization. And then I would definitely, definitely want to visit um, Athens and um, ancient Olympia, which is one of my favorite sites in the classical times. I would want to walk around the Agora and uh, get to meet uh, Socrates or Pericles and see the Parthenon at its ground. But I would also love to go uh, experience Olympia when the Olympic Games were at their peak. There's so many periods. I think it's too difficult to choose. Crete would be amazing to see, as you mentioned, since the evidence mm -hmm. we have just looks like an amazing civilization. And our last question for this evening, I'm just kind of curious, Nikki, if you close your eyes and you picture Greece, what are the things that come to mind? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, I love my country and um, um, I, I would only think of um, nice things, although <laughs> all of us in all countries around the world, I think we have many reasons to complain about different things. Um, the amazing reflection of the sun on, on marble, on um, the water, especially when um, it rises or when it sets, the different... Um, the different um, um, flowers we get uh, throughout the year blooming all around the country and the, um, the smell of them and uh, the tranquility of um, the countryside. Well, that both gave me chills and made me tear up. So I think that's an excellent <laughs> description. And well, Nikki, thank you again, Afari Stowe. Thanks so much for joining us this morning where you are. Yeah. Thank you. And all of the people that um, uh, got to connect and uh, watch and hear uh, what we had to say it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nikki. It was a delight to have you. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Next week, Rick will be back and he will be going, taking us to Florence. And so you can sign up at ricksteves.com slash MNT. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And we'll just say our good night. So good night, Nikki. Good night. Good night, Lisa. Good night, everyone. Hello, MNT community. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm excited to share with you our March lineup of shows. Our wonderful cartographer, Dave Herline, made us a map. Let's take a peek. We kick off March with a show on Athens and the Greek islands with Nikki Vlaku. On March 13th, we're headed to Florence, Italy with Rick. On March 20th, we're exploring Poland with Cameron Hewitt and Tomasz Klimek, and we round out the month with Jana Ronkova and her hometown of Prague. We hope that you can join us. You can register for all of the shows at ricksteves.com slash MNT. Ciao, ciao.